When we say survivor centered, uh, what we mean is that the way forward, um, decisions, next steps, processes are based fundamentally in mindfulness for what will be just and healthy and good for the person who was most directly harmed, which, which is situations of abuse are survivors. Okay. Okay. One, two, ready, go. Welcome to the Called to be Bad podcast. My name is Mariah Martin, and I feel called to be bad. It turns out I'm not the only one. Join us as we dig into all things bad, scandalous, deviant, you know, the stuff that makes good church folks squirm in the sanctuary. Why? Well, because sometimes the scandalous is spiritual, deviant is divine, and bad is beautiful. Say yes to the call and let's see what holy trouble we get into today. Hi, Stephanie. Hi, Hillary. Hi. Hi. Welcome to the podcast. Um, so today we have Stephanie and Hillary who work for um, Into Account, and um, so Stephanie is um, PhD executive director and co-founder. She is a scholar, advocate, and speaker with expertise in social change movements, trauma, and, and, and institutional violence. She holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Kansas with a graduate certificate in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies. Trained in ethnography and oral history, Stephanie works with survivors who want to tell their stories in a public forum. As an advocate, Stephanie specializes in working with student activists concerned with campus sexualized violence, as well as LGBTQ justice issues. In addition, she consults with administrators and church leaders who are interested in making their communal spaces safer and more attentive to trauma. Stephanie's upcoming book, due in August, I learned, uh, Pacifist Battlegrounds examines the definition of violence and the gender politics of Christian pacifism against the backdrop of LGBTQ organizing in the Mennonite Church USA. And I definitely want to get my hands on that book when it comes out, because that sounds amazing. <laughs> um, do. It is amazing. I believe it. <laughs> I'm ready for it. <laughs> Um, and then we have Hillary Jerome Sarcella, Scarcella, sorry, and um, she is the PhD Director of Theological Integrity. Hillary is a scholar, speaker, and advocate with expertise in trauma, theology, ethics, religious practice, and policies relevant to sexual violence. She is committed to an intersectional approach to resisting sexual violence, one that centers racial justice. Her work at Into Account focuses on direct partnership with and advocacy for survivors. She is the primary point person on the IA team for assessing the implicit and explicit theological dimensions of community practices, policies, social patterns, modes of communication, etc. So that the religious dimension of survivors experience can be named, validated, and addressed in the communities that produce them. In addition to working directly with survivors, uh, Hillary develops resources to support high quality theological education on the subject of sexual violence. As part of that work, she consults with religious leaders and communities who want to develop a culture that is more trauma informed, mindful of sexualized violence survivors who are members of the community and wise with respect to members who are perpetrators. Outside of her work with Into Account, Hillary is Assistant Professor of Ethics and Director of the Gender, Sexual, and Racial Justice Program at Colgate, is that how you say that? Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School. Wow, that is a lot. You all are, I already can tell, are like rock stars. I hope that doesn't sound too cavalier. That was supposed to be a compliment. Like, that, that is, those are, that's amazing. Those are amazing bios. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to talk with you all today. Um, and do you call it into account? Is it an organization? Is it a foundation? Um, it's a it's a nonprofit. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. OK, OK. So no. organization is fine. OK, <laughs> thanks. Um, yeah, and so I'm also curious, before we get started, um, what mugs do you have? What are you drinking today? Well, this mug, it's backwards, obviously, on Zoom, but it says Daryl, which is my father-in-law's name because I'm at my parents-in-law's house right now in Kansas City, um, and it's a Seattle tourist mug, and I'm drinking Bigelow Earl Grey. Very nice. And Hillary, what do you have? 
So I am drinking a uh, fabulous ginger tea, 100% just ginger, uh, which is the best way to drink ginger tea in case you were not aware. Um, and this, this is just a very plain navy blue mug that I fell in love with at a Goodwill, I think like 12 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and is one of my most um, prized possessions. I don't drink out of it nearly often enough because uh, it is not as gigantic as one typically needs for morning coffee, um, but this is special, so I thought it was time for a special mug. Um, well, there's no, there's no real great transition into our questions from coffee to talking about into account, but, you know, here we go, right? Diving right in. Um, so can you describe what exactly into account does as an organization and who it primarily serves sure. oh wait sorry before i start that um i think it'd probably be good to have a content warning um so i don't know if you all have like a content warning sometimes you do if you do talks or anything or should we just come up with something um we can yeah we can come up with i mean Basically, we're going to be talking about sexual violence. Um, nothing that we talk about is going to be particularly explicit. However, if you've experienced it in any way, um, you have to be mindful of your, of your feelings. And please do not hesitate to duck out if you need to. Um, if this isn't a subject that you have the capacity for right now, there's absolutely no shame in not watching and not listening. Yeah. And if you but, find that you would like to process some of what comes up for you, um, check out Into Account's website. Yeah. Hello, beloved baddies. A quick break to tell you that this episode is sponsored by the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul, a nonprofit that supports and amplifies the voices of edgewalkers through art that catalyzes change, laughter that brings us together and soul awakening to the creative spark within us. The support from the Center for Art, Humor, and Soul has meant the world to this podcast, so I highly encourage you to check out their website, arthumorandsoul.com, to see their other featured artists and projects. If you want to support the podcast, you can check out our Patreon or get in touch. Now I'll let you get back to this episode of Called to be Bad. So yeah, let's get back to the question. Um, can you describe what exactly into account does as an organization and who it serves? Sure. Um, I'll try to do the brief version. Hillary, feel free to add. And um, into account, we were founded in 2016. Um, we became our own nonprofit in 2017. And our goal is basically to provide survivor centered guidance um, in relation to sexual violence. And while we don't only work with Christian contexts, we do primarily, and that is our specialty. So we're not a faith-based organization, um, but we do specialize in abuse that happens in a faith context um, because one of, the, one of the gaps that we were seeing was that there were not very many services available to survivors that took into account, you can see where we got our title, <laughs> um, that took into account that when abuse happens in a religious context, that there's gen generally an element of spiritual abuse or the, the entirety of the abuse may be spiritual abuse and people don't take that seriously and they should, it's incredibly damaging. Um, so we wanted to make sure that there were survivors or that there were services available for survivors that really were, you know, had advocates who were educated in what spiritual abuse and sexual abuse happening side by side actually look like. And that had trauma informed ways of working with survivors who are going through it. So the, um, the population that we are sort of here for primarily is survivors. Um, our services are always free to survivors. And when we do consult with institutions, with churches, or with, you know, any, any like, like sometimes pastors will, will call us and say, I have this situation, I don't know what to do, I'm worried I'm gonna mess up, my denomination doesn't provide me with really any guidance here, can you help? 
um, we will always give like a free, a free hour of consultation to somebody. And we, we've done lots of, we've done lots of work that way. Um, but sometimes we'll just do an hourly rate and, and help some, you know, help a, a church get through a particular situation. Um, however, it's, it always comes back to survivors. If people call us for consultation, they call us knowing that they're going to get survivor centered um, advice. And we would argue that survivor centered advice is better for everybody, including perpetrators. Um, but as you can imagine, that is not always, uh, <laughs> that is not always a perspective that is received uh, with grace and understanding um, or gratitude. <laughs> so it is, you know, being survivor centered means that you also have to be, be ready and willing to deal with conflict. So we do a lot of that. Well, That's a very short version. Hillary, is there anything you want to fill in? Yeah, I think maybe what I want to add just um, from the get go is that when we say that we offer services to survivors, we're not talking about counseling, like individual counseling services. Um, we don't do legal services. So there are, I would say probably the majority of organizations that focus on sexual violence, um, services fall into those categories and a couple of others. Um, what we do, is when we're working with survivors is really um, meet with survivors to listen to what it is that they are looking for in order to move toward a greater measure of um, justice um, for themselves, transformation in their community that would address what happened um, and also work to prevent what happened from happening again in the future. So we're really organized around meeting survivors' wishes, needs, and desires for, um, I don't know, a, a just transformed future. Um, and so what our services look like for every individual client differ based on that person's situation and what would make for just transformation in that particular context. Um, so we don't have like a slate of services that you just kind of, you know, like sign up for. <laughs> it's more um, a relational um, and professional process. Sure. I, I, I'm curious why it is so important that it is survivor centered and why so many other organizations aren't survivor centered when it seems like that would be most helpful. Hillary, yeah, that's yeah, a really good one. Um, yeah, so when we say survivor centered, uh, what we mean is that the way forward, um, decisions, next steps, processes are based fundamentally in mindfulness for what will be just and healthy and good for the person who was most directly harmed, which, which is situations of abuse are survivors. That means um, that, for example, institutions are not prioritizing their legal liability concerns. Um, <laughs> and that's really, you know, there are all sorts of reasons why individuals and institutions would not choose a survivor centered process. Um, but we find that this is by and large, um, the most significant one is that oftentimes even small communities of faith right up onto large, um, educational institutions prioritize, for themselves a sense of legal and financial security and, and also reputational security. Um, this is what drives folks to do things like offer non-disclosure agreements saying, okay, we will give you some form of financial restitution if you agree not to talk about what our community did to you. Um, and so it's really a kind of immediate surface level personal interest um, that oftentimes drives folks away from a survivor-centered process. However, um, another big one that we see um, 
is that especially within Christian communities of faith, um, there will be some kind of argument that a survivor centered process is not Christian because it does not take both sides equally or folks um, will sometimes claim that a process that validates survivors' anger about violence done to them is a process that is not following Christian principles of love and forgiveness and understanding for a perpetrator or an enabler. Um, so, so there's this kind of institutional, legal, financial side of things, and then there is also a certain way that Christian and Western US culture together, and those things I would argue are pretty mingled together at this point, um, is not set up to be able to respect and validate the principles um, and the theological principles that undergird what a survivor-centered process is. Man, yeah. A question about language. Um, so I read the book, um, Know My Name by Chanel Miller, and um, I thought it was really excellent. It's a memoir, um, but I struggle knowing how to like tell people about the book because most people know about it um, through the perpetrator lens of like, this was um, the victim of Brock Turner, um, mm -hmm. who was like the swimmer and everyone was like, oh, he, you know, what about his swimming scholarship and like, just like horrible things. And so I try to say, like when I'm introducing the book in a survivor center way, what would be the best way to say, like, this book is about Chanel Miller. I want to center her story, but like people don't know her story. I mean, that's the whole point of book of the book is like, know my name. Um, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, it absolutely makes sense. And and that dynamic that you just shared is a perfect example of what I mean when I said earlier that we are coming from a society and a cultural culture that um, is not neutral, but actually is perpetrator centered. <laughs> the fact that we define survivors based on their relationship to I the one who assaulted them, that that's our way of talking about who survivors are. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in us just having an open conversation about this, but what came to mind immediately for me was perhaps, you know, this is the person who worked to hold Brock Turner accountable for his violence against her. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, so I don't know if, if this is appropriate and you can tell me if it's not, but um, can you give an example of the kind of work that you do? Sure. Yeah. I mean, there are plenty of things we can talk about with examples. Um, so I, I'll, I'll give you like two to give you an example of different scale. So, um, one of the first clients that we had, one of the first survivor clients that we have is now, um, our employee, uh, Aaron Bergen, who is our director of student advocacy. Um, Aaron went to Goshen college and experienced sexual assault while she was there. Um, she came to us because she had heard, you know, things that survivors hear in so many settings, which are, you know, you're causing trouble. Um, this is just a witch hunt for you. Like how many times have we heard witch hunt misused in that way? Um, and, you know, she was, she was, she experienced a lot of additional trauma from the Title IX, you know, Title IX is the overarching federal civil, civil rights legislation that guarantees equal access to education for people of all genders. Um, one, of the, one of the things that Title IX ostensibly protects us against is uh, sexual assault um, and sexual assault, sexual harassment um, are seen as educational access issues under Title IX, um, under the broad umbrella of gender discrimination. So with that said, um, any, any college or university or school in the country that gets, um, in the United States, that gets federal funding um, has to have uh, Title IX, is, is subject to Title IX federal law. So Erin was already educated in Title IX um, and decided to go through, <laughs> you know, she had already filed a Title IX complaint with the school and it had gone badly. So she decided to file a federal complaint. This was, 
back when Obama was still president before Trump's Department of Education with Betsy DeVos at the helm completely gutted the Title IX regulations. So that's a whole other <laughs> conversation. But what we did was we helped Aaron file a federal Title IX complaint. Um, and we were able to do that, you know, with an understanding that that a lot of what she was dealing with were the sort of the Christian responses to sexual violence that Hillary just enumerated. Um, you know, she was being vindictive. She, <laughs> like, she needed to just let it go, you know, just all of that stuff. Um, that complaint was actually relatively successful um, in that the federal government found that Goshen was in, in violation of Title IX regulations and um, implemented, made, you know, held them accountable to implement some changes. Although that accountability was somewhat, <laughs> somewhat curtailed by the fact that the Department of Education went into different hands. So that's one example. Um, we did, we helped her with something that is a very common thing for college students to end up having to deal with, which is sexual assault and the choice of how to handle it in relation to federal law. Um, we're dealing with a Christian college, so we were able to provide the additional support that comes with dealing with um, how these things go down in a Christian institution. You know, a much different situation is the, you know, we received a complaint through our online, our online um, reporting form about the Catholic composer, David Haas, who um, for people who are familiar with, with hymnody, I mean, he wrote, you are mine, blessed are they, peace before us. And a number of hymns that are popular, not only in a Catholic context, but in many Protestant context as well. Um, in contemporary and more progressive Catholic communities, David Haas has formed a huge, I mean, has been a huge part of, of Catholic liturgy. And so once we got that report, um, we got a few more, we started working with survivors. Um, we gradually managed to get the word out that people who were victimized by him had reported to us and you know, now over a year later, we're at well over 50. <laughs> we, I mean, we just received more in this past week. Um, that's an example of a case where we're working directly with survivors and there are also so many different layers of institutional involvement that we're helping survivors to negotiate. Um, so for instance, David Haas is a contractor, he worked with a bunch of different Catholic institutions, but without really any real oversight from any of them. And so it creates, for an individual survivor, it creates a, you know, many women tried to do something when they were, when they were assaulted um, or groomed or abused by him, but they couldn't get anywhere <laughs> because there was no system in place that would take them seriously. So that ended up being you know, a pretty enormous project for us just because we had to be, we, and we continue to work on being just a very consistent survivor-centered process as these multiple institutions, you know, from the Archdiocese of Minneapolis, St. Paul, to David Haas's former music publisher, to multiple colleges and universities where he had some sort of involvement trying to figure out what were we responsible for? What are we responsible for now? And what kind of language are we going to use to communicate with survivors and with the public about how we see our responsibility? Um, as you can imagine, um, dealing with liability concerns there has been enormous. And so <laughs> there's the question of, um, okay, you're, one of the th one of the things that happens in a situation like this is people are, you know, dozens of survivors are coming forward within a relatively short period of time, talking about a single perpetrator, and so the over the sense of overwhelm for people in institutional roles where they, you know, they're going to be held accountable is huge, and the opportunity to mess up is huge. Um, and 
just being able to communicate that you have a sense of social responsibility that goes beyond, do we like this music? And is, you know, I mean, so much of the work that we've done has been around, why is it not okay to sing David Haas's music? You know, and many of the survivors who have reported to us are musicians who have heard like, basically that they're being unchristian if they don't wanna use this music. And, <laughs> So it's just, okay, so we're having conversations about theologically what is important when we're entertaining the question of whether or not to use the music of a serial sexual abuser. At the same time, we're having conversations about why would it be a good thing for your institution to admit publicly to some wrongdoing, even when your lawyers are telling you not to do that. We, you know, that's, that's, I, it can be difficult to always be the person who's telling institutional leaders the opposite of what their lawyers are telling them. That's part of, <laughs> that's part of the, you know, I mean, that's part of the deal when you're trying to move people out of a liability framework. Liability frameworks for institutions um, are largely based on blanket denial or like extremely qualified language. And so the language that is the norm is language that produces trauma in people who have already been victimized. Um, so those are just two different examples of negotiating that with together with survivors. Right. <clears throat> Can I add a couple? Yeah, I was just gonna say, Hillary, do you wanna add more? Yeah. Well, just, just related to those examples um, that Stephanie gave, so um, some of the like concrete thing, well, concrete ways that advocacy looks in those situations are, um, for example, there was a, a very comprehensive report that we developed based on um, the over 50 now reports um, of abuse that we received from survivors of David Haas. So that report um, created an opportunity for public analysis of the claims that survivors were making, um, which then functioned as a kind of tool um, for helping institutions <laughs> encouraging institutions to do the right thing, right? And also giving um, validation, affirmation um, to survivors whose stories were being told in this kind of context. Um, so that kind of systems analysis is something that into account does pretty often um, when uh, survivors are asking for it. Um, we also, in that case, I think supported and helped survivors who were interested in talking to journalists understand kind of what was at risk for them in doing so, and also helped to vet the journalists um, to, to try to help people know whether this was a safe or unsafe conversation that they were walking into. Um, some survivors chose to write up their own personal narratives um, of abuse and of their resistance to Haas's abuse. And we have a platform um, that we make available to survivors for telling their own individual stories in their own voices when they want to do that. Um, I had some more things, but I just wanted to give some kind of concrete um, examples to flesh out the broader sort of picture that Stephanie painted about the kinds of situations that we are invited to walk with survivors in. What the platform that you were talking about, about sharing their own stories, is that our stories untold or is that a separate thing that you're talking about? That's our, our stories untold. And actually I came to into account um, at least partially through my previous work with Our Stories Untold. So Our Stories Untold was a project originally started by Rachel Halder. Um, and I worked with her on that project um, for a few years. And then I became the director of that project when she left. And then um, shortly after Into Account was formed, I joined Into Account and we kind of um, shifted Our Stories Untold to be one of the tools that Into Account has available to offer um, to survivors. So it is, it's, it is still called Our Stories Untold, but it is a platform run and managed by Into Account at this point. 
Okay. Yeah, that's helpful to know the relationship between the two because I knew they were connected somehow. Um, but yeah. Um, so this is a big question. Um, but I, I'm curious your opinions on what are the roots of violence in this situation, particularly sexual violence within Christian communities. Um, so like what patterns of abuse do you encounter um, and call out as red flags or problematic? Um, and, and you could answer this from a theological, sociological, political standpoint, whichever makes the most sense to you. So you want to be here for like the next 10 hours? I know. I know. I know this is a huge question. Um, PhD is that question. <laughs> um, Hillary, why don't, why don't you uh, start, oh, start with your, start with your areas, then I, I can jump in with mine. <laughs> I mean, when you say what's the root, um, my mind is going all the way back to um, how the church organized itself in the first second, third, fourth, fifth centuries. Um, I don't think that's necessarily exactly where we want this conversation to go um, <laughs> today. Although, you know, email me if you wanna talk more. Uh, <laughs> but when I, so I think one of the ways to get into this conversation is to talk about particular um, Christian doctrines. And I don't mean like specific language of a particular Christian church. When I say doctrine, I just mean like general theological concepts um, that are understood in a sort of amorphous shared cultural way. So talking about things like sin, like atonement, like forgiveness, like love, um, there is a certain way of defining all of these kind of core basic Christian notions um, and their ideas, but they're also practices, right? Like we know what love is as an idea, but then folks in communities of faith are also very quick to point out that's loving, that's not loving. Um, so ideas and their connection to actions, when these notions are defined um, in fairly, traditional ways, um, they together kind of build this web that uh, creates what I would probably call a theological culture of violence, a theological culture of abuse. It has everything to do with um, cultures of whiteness and white supremacy. It has everything to do with um, hetero patriarchy. Um, so these are not separate from kind of cultural forms of oppression, um, but they also don't explicitly kind of reveal themselves that way on the surface, <laughs> unless you really dig in. Um, so for example, just to like actually get specific, um, oftentimes sin is thought of as a personal failure um, something that I, me have done wrong. And usually sin is framed as a form of pridefulness or centering of the self. Um, and this is where we get back to Christian history because we have like hundreds of years ago, Christian theologians who explicitly defined sin this way. And we carry that with us. So if sin is anytime I have prioritized myself over another person, then a, a, in a situation of sexual violence where you have a victim or a survivor who is trying to resist or trying to get out of that situation, it is almost always spun as the victim prioritizing themselves over the comfort of the community, over the voice of the perpetrator. Um, and so sin gets mapped onto the victim rather than on those who are enabling the problem or perpetrating the problem. Same thing with love. When love is conceived as, um, a kind of sentimental, warm, optimistic uh, perspective that gives everyone the benefit of the doubt, mm -hmm. then um, a community extending love to a perpetrator or someone who has been accused of sexual violence looks like giving that person the benefit of the doubt, committing to valuing them even though they may have done this bad thing. And I'm not saying that perpetrators should not be valued as human beings, but when 
that is done in this, um, this matrix of ideas and actions that enable sexual violence, um, it basically excuses violent behavior. Um, so we need to redefine uh, what these theological words mean and what they look like in action if we're going to shift from a Christian culture that enables abuse to a Christian culture that identifies it um, and actively resists it. Yeah. Well, you took a whole thesis and you um, got it out in a, a paragraph. So I commend you that. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. I really appreciate that. Stephanie, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, I mean, and this is this is just piggybacking on Hillary's basically. I mean, I think that who we see as, whose humanity we value mm -hmm. um, plays a huge role in who is vulnerable to sexual violence, who is targeted for it. And, you know, I mean, of course I, my area is, is American studies and understanding history through, through a lens of power analysis. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you look at the, if you look at the history of human beings um, exhibiting ownership over each other, <laughs> um, you can get a pretty good idea of what the patterns are of like, who's, who is going to be targeted for sexual violence. And, you know, people with disabilities, for instance, their, their humanity is, is not, is in our society is not valued as it should be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and people with disabilities, if there's, if you want to choose one demographic that is more disproportionately targeted mm -hmm. for sexual violence, that, that might be one, broadly speaking. Um, if you look at the history of the United States um, with slavery, and genocide as sort of our cornerstones of settler, you know, our settler colonialist nation state. Um, both of those endeavors were sustained through enormous amounts of sexual violence. Mm -hmm. And which is why I, it is impossible to talk about sexual violence in our historical context without talking about white supremacy. Um, so, you know, I will sort of go down a rabbit hole and think, well, when, when, how did we get here? How did we get here? And, you know, without wanting to make any overarching pronouncements, I think if you look at the way that people of European descent have treated their children for maybe the past thousand years that we, you know, for European history, in the time that we that we know it, <laughs> um, I'm not saying that all of recorded history is a thousand years, but let's just let's just talk about the past millennium for the sake of conciseness. The level of brutality that we have exhibited towards our children, um, I don't think that we we have the evidence that this is the human norm or that this is how human beings need to raise children. Mm -hmm. But when you understand the effects that childhood trauma have on how human beings function as adults, and then you think about trauma as cycles, I would argue that we're still very much in thrall to cycles of, um, <laughs> of punishing mm -hmm. children for the things that happened to us as adults, as children. And that may seem simplistic, but you know, I've been, <laughs> I've been studying these subjects academically for a long time. And then it, it was just getting into direct advocacy with that background that made it really click for me how profoundly destabilizing child abuse is for our society. Um, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, spiritual abuse. And you look at the normative practices of a lot of US church culture. And it teaches children <laughs> to, to suppress their emotions. It sexualizes children in a way that is utterly unnecessary. You know, if you go into, 
if you go into a really, really hierarchical, patriarchal, conservative, purity culture driven church context, you hear people talking about their little boys and girls as though they're ready to have sex. Mm. It's just like there's, so it's just, um, I think that we're really, really messed up <laughs> in, in US society, in North American society. I'm, I'm just gonna speak broadly about what I know. And we pass that stuff on. The people, people who have to survive the oppression of being dehumanized, of being targeted, of being sexually exploited, um, don't, broadly speaking, we don't give people the resources to survive that well. Um, we punish them for the things that you do, that we do in order to survive. We punish people for that. So I think we're, I think we're in some really devastating cycles as a society that are really deeply historically rooted. And, um, you know, that's, maybe that's the historical side of the, the theology that Hillary was talking about, but I think more or less we're talking about the same thing. <laughs> We absolutely are because the theological kind of grounding narrative that I think accounts for the dynamics that you were just talking about, Stephanie, is a traditional um, interpretation of atonement in which God the Father um, allows, requires, demands, what have you, something, um, ordains uh, lethal bodily and also sexual violence against God's son, Jesus, in the process of crucifixion. Um, and that this, Jesus is going along with this act of divine child abuse um, is what saves the world. Um, so a child willing to um, be abused, accept abuse, um, is how salvation comes. Therefore, uh, that belief then, uh, influences not only one's personal worship, um, but how you conceive of politics, how you conceive of family life, how you conceive of what Christian education means. And absolutely this is, um, kind of, very over the top and explicit in conservative white evangelical sort of um, context. But we also see it in liberal progressive Christianity. <laughs> we see it coming from folks who call themselves feminists. We see it from folks who call themselves anti-racists. Uh, we see it from uh, communities who would never explicitly teach that kind of theology but are still operating out of these cultural, historical, theological norms. Yeah. And you talk about how like um, we are supposed to love one another as um, Jesus loved the church or Jesus loved God. And so then there's this model of ultimate self-sacrifice and that that is supposed to be love, that that's supposed to be faith. And um, yeah, what you said, Stephanie, about how we punish people for the ways that they they're, 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 um, how did you say it? For the ways that they try and survive, um, that's gonna stick with me, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you for, for all of that. To hear the full conversation, tune into the next episode of Called to be Bad. Here's a preview of what's to come in part two. We like to joke about how um, we have all been individually and collectively uh, accused of trying to destroy the church, <laughs> trying to burn down the church. Um, we joke about that because that is not what we are trying to do. And yet there is this tiny little kernel of truth in there because if you define church as a theological institution given life through the concepts and the practices that we've talked about as fundamentally enabling of sexual violence, then yes, actually, we are trying to dismantle that. That's all for this episode of Called to be Bad. Keep being your bad, beautiful selves and I will see you next time.